I tried to uh, put a framing around the, the historical uh, transition of our industry. That was a revolutionary idea at the time, and it, it had all kinds of implications. Welcome to Telecom Disruptors, a podcast that takes a closer look at the people and technology is changing the way the world communicates. I'm Alan Percy, Senior Director of Product Marketing at Telco Bridges and your podcast host. And in this episode, we're checking in with Jonathan Rosenberg. He's the ex-CTO of Cisco Collaboration. And Jonathan, thanks for spending some time with us today. Hey, my pleasure to be here. Certainly, Jonathan, you've you've had a distinguished uh, career to this point. I'm sure there's much more fun to come. Uh, but one of the key uh, milestones, I think, that the industry owes you, uh, you know, a debt of gratitude is you were one of the original contributors uh, to the specification we now know as RFC 3261, yep. or SIP, the foundation of the modern IP-based communication infrastructure. And I thought we could start with just a little bit of a look back at how that all happened and h- how did it come to be, and then we'll get into our discussion about the future of communications. So. Yeah. Let's just start with how, how did you know how did this start? How did how did you end up in that situation? Yeah, so like a lot of things is sort of a bunch of luck and good timing and and hard work on top of that that sort of all added up to it. So I was um, I was employed at Bell Laboratories. I just finished my master's thesis. It was my first job out of school, and I was in the Bell Labs research group. And uh, in this research group, everybody had a PhD. So my uh, boss said, "Oh, you should go get a PhD." Uh, you know, that's what we do. So I was okay. So I applied to Columbia University, and they had this uh, program for remote learning. They would they would mail you VHS tapes, uh, just to <laughs> set the timeline a little bit uh, yeah. for the classes. So I did that, uh, and I was in the program for a year or two, sort of struggling to find a topic. And then this new faculty member came to Columbia University. This guy Henning Schulzerini uh, had just joined, and he was sort of known as one of the early internet guys doing real time communications. And so I said, oh, let me see if he's got any interesting topics. So I met with him, and it was pretty clear that we had a lot of synergy and uh, thought about things in the same kind of way. And I came on as his first PhD student, and he said, hey, I'm working on this thing called SIP, which is this research project for, uh, you know, mostly focused on initiating um, multicast-based group conversations at the time on Mm -hmm. the internet. Why don't you work on that? And so I started to work on that, and it sort of grew from there as uh, basically was my PhD thesis topic. Uh, that I worked on while working in the standards bodies uh, to grow and evolve the technology. And it sort of it gained more and more momentum uh, as obviously as time went on. But that was the, at least for me, that was the, that was the genesis of, uh, of that one. Yeah, and it's interesting too because I distinctly remember at the time, right, we were all doing H323, which was basically a IP-based version of ISDN. Exactly, yeah. And it was a breakthrough in the sense that it it was unbounded from what it could, what SIP could be used for, as opposed to it just replicating the yeah. you know the legacy um, TDM network. So uh, obviously a huge step. And, I, and I'm sort of curious: did 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 SIP become what you expected, or more or less? Or uh, sort of curious. <laughs> In some ways more, in some ways less. Um, obviously in the more, when we started, I, I think it was almost hard to conceive that it would now it would become this foundation of all of modern telecommunications and, and be the way the phone network works and created all these different industries and markets. I, I, in that sense, it was way more than I think right. we expected it to be. Um, in other ways, it was less. And sort of one of the ways I was ultimately really disappointed was, sort of as you're hinting at, compared to 323, we really wanted to do more than just a plain old phone call. And a lot of SIP's design was about bringing in other elements of internet technology. So how do you integrate web and Mm -hmm. email and and the the broader internet technology landscape into real-time communication? Uh, And uh, and that part of it was was only, it only delivered mixed success, right? It was less than I had hoped. If you look at how most people have deployed SIP, it's largely used as a replacement for circuit switch telephony um, and it Mm -hmm. largely delivers a telephony-based experience. Now, not entirely, of course. There's video, and there are some innovative use cases, but I I don't think it it achieved that home run we hoped where it would revolutionize the phone. Um, So so that was sort of like a little disappointing. Right. And, you know, one of the other interesting things about SIP, too, is that I I can clearly tell the original vision was a pure peer-to-peer network. 
Yeah. And it's that's never really come to fruition. It, yeah. Almost all SIP interactions today go through some kind of um, centralized server, right? That goes through you know some kind of IPPBX or UC platform or yes. or conferencing platform. So it's sort of interesting how that morphed. Yeah, yeah. The, the SIP network, as we envisioned it, right? As you said, of this distributed worldwide network of largely stateless SIP proxies, never really manifested. Right. Um, and and it was it's sort of a testimony to the design of the protocol that you could change the underlying architecture of the system mm-hmm. while still keeping the protocol on all its interoperability, and in fact allow some people to still run their own little domains in that way if they so desired, and the whole thing would still work together. But you're totally right. Most, the, the way SIP is used right now, it's an interface, right? right. It's a, it, it exists as a point-to-point connection between two entities. The spec, by the way, would be dramatically thinner and and much easier to implement and understand had we actually designed it with that in mind in the first right. place. But I don't know that it would have achieved its success if it hadn't sort of envisioned this whole broader thing. Because a, a lot of people in the early days were excited about this vision, right? It was a sort of a, mm-hmm. a different way uh, to think about how to deliver telephony on the internet. It was the And we designed it with this sort of end-to-end principle in mind. This is one of the guiding design principles for the internet, which is to put things at the endpoints and not put them centrally in the network. Sure. And, um, and it was sort of a manifestation of that. So, but, but yeah, well, lots of things turn out differently. Yeah. Yes, they do. Well, I remember in the early, early days we were giving out little fold out cards that were basically SIP 101, you know, like reference cards. Yep. And uh, it's kind of, I should have saved one of those. That would have been kind of fun to keep. Yeah, one of those yeah. in, but anyway, <laughs> I have a collection of SIP memorabilia from here and there. Yeah, I bet. Well, you know, a lot of that library that's um, on my bookshelf behind me is uh, exactly. if you were to get a close up, you'd see there's a lot of, uh, you know, like Alan Johnson's book and some of the other materials yep. in there. So, that's awesome. So we um we had an opportunity this fall uh, to cross paths at SIPNOC 2018 and uh, uh, and and you delivered a keynote that I thought was fascinating, which is the you know the, the crux of why we're getting together today. And um, you titled the session "The Implications of Enterprise Cloud on SIP Networks." Uh, and you talked about that there were three areas of enterprise telecom: a hardware, a software, and a cloud. Uh, as a as a start of that presentation, so. Um, it, could you do us a favor and sort of share what that was all about, what your thought process was? Yeah, you know, I, I tried to uh, put a framing around the, the historical uh, transition of our industry. And so I, I sort of seemed to be there are these three eras, right? The first era was all about hardware. And this is the TDM and circuit-based switching. And if we focus on the enterprise side, it was the era of the, the classic traditional circuit-based PBX. Um, and it had with it a set of vendors you know, Nortel and Avai at the time that were the leaders in this space. Uh, and it was all about a dedicated, separated network that was all about making phone calls. And mm-hmm. the big change that happened, which was, was facilitated by technologies like IP and SIP, was that we were able to transition that away from hardware to software. So instead of buying a, a physical box that was your PBX and having a dedicated network, you could just have a piece of software that ran on a, on a computer that implemented your PBX and, and everything else was just connected over an IP network. Right. And that, that was a revolutionary idea at the time. And it, it had all kinds of implications. Uh, some of them not obvious. Uh, for example, it meant that you could move your PBX out of the branch offices and into the data center. Mm-hmm. And that's a, that was a massive consolidation play. Uh, that was a huge cost saver. Because it used to be you had to dump one of these PBXs in every single location and, I had a whole team to manage it, and, and oh my God, it was a big pain. So now I could consolidate it while still having to force phones in every branch office. And, and so that transit, you know, huge technology transition and a vendor change too. So mm-hmm. uh, Cisco in particular, uh, obviously Avaya was still in this market, but, but a, a shadow of its former glory for sure. And Nortel went out of business, but, but you know, new vendors came in and the market shifted. And, and we were in this software era uh, for a long while. And over the last few years, we've begun the transition to the now, the third era. Uh, of cloud-based delivery. Now, of course, there's still software. <laughs> I mean, gosh, there was still software in the hardware era too. But, but it is a it is a fundamentally different technology delivery vehicle. Um, yeah, you give some examples on the cloud space too: the Ring Central, eight by eight, Vonage, Verizon. Exactly. So different cloud providers. Yeah, different providers and a different technology approach. Right. Mm-hmm. A single vendor, a SaaS provider that owns the develops the software, deploys and operates the software, delivers the software as a service. 
to customers and the only thing on the customer premises is the desk phone. Um, right. And so that's a you know, dramatic shift as well that is enabling uh, different uh, you know, faster consumption models, ease of global deployment, um, and much better uh, innovation in features, uh, simplicity of management, massive cost savings. So, so it's driving this next wave of transition and, and we're still in the early phases of it. So I, I pushed sure. my presentation, 2018 is sort of the turnaround point uh, for this. Uh, you know, I, I think depending on who you ask, they think in 2020, for example, is when we'll see a shift to 50% uh, of new line sales for phones will be cloud-based. Uh, we'll see if we hit that, but, but it, it's getting there. So that's a, it's a, you know, it's a reasonable uh, point of which to declare the transition. So, right. so it's fun to be there in the beginning. Yeah. yeah, as it was. Well, matter of fact, I, one point of, in time that I remember is that is there was a point, and I distinctly remember this point when um, we were selling IP phones. They were getting used with COT servers, and people were buying software applications to put on that COT server to drive those phones. And there was a moment when it kind of hit everyone. I said, wait a second here. If I don't like this application, I can swap the software out and yeah. buy a different application and keep all my hardware. Yeah. And that was just mind blowing compared to, you know, the legacy um, forklift that was required to swap out a PBX if you didn't like yeah. it. Exactly. And that's and getting then, even easier now, by the way. Oh, yeah. Uh, right. You know, right. Um, right. Port your numbers. If the phones are sometimes you have to swap the phones off it. But but uh, for them, a lot of them, you can just, you know, upgrade. They'll upgrade the software and boom, you know, next you can literally move your whole phone system. Uh, there are some many caveats in that, but it, it, but the cloud makes it easier for sure. Sure, absolutely. So then, you, you uh, as part of your presentation, you talked about some um, um, different segments at, at different stages, and then um, what you've got is um, kind of a, a sliding scale between premise and cloud, and then you've got different applications and team collaboration, CPaaS meetings, etc. Um, maybe walk us through uh, what your thoughts were on this on this chart. Yeah, so enterprise collaboration, of course, has got a bunch of different products underneath it, and so I think it's generally. Um, you know, other everyone segments it sort of this way. You've got team collaboration is a fairly new segment you know, that is new, modern, persistent group chat. Um, there are the main apps are things like uh, you know WebEx Teams, formerly Cisco Spark that I worked on at Cisco, and Microsoft Teams and Slack is the most famous one. Right. Uh, then you've got um, CPaaS, which is another relatively new category of APIs, largely for sending SMSs and doing IVR type of operations, and that's Twilio and, and, and Nexmo and Clevo and formerly Tropo at Cisco. Uh, and you have classic meetings, products, uh, UCAS, which is really largely telephony as a service, and then contact center as a service. So if you look at these different areas, um, Team Collab and CPaaS are 100% cloud. They for the they never They're really kind of born in the cloud and, have, cloud. and right, exactly. They never come. Yeah. And there are a few small exceptions to that. Um, Atlassian's um, HipChat was actually available on prem and there's some open source stuff, but, but this is like a 98% kind of thing in terms of cloud. CPaaS right. is always cloud-based. It was sort of the entire idea of the, the whole product was because it's cloud-based, you can now send an SMS to every phone number from anywhere. Uh, and right. you need little individual appointments. Um, meetings has been mixed between prem and cloud, but, but has largely been cloud-based for a while. So WebEx and Zoom and, and uh, Microsoft, uh, in there. Um, and then the, the probably the more interesting ones now are the last two, which are are still mostly premise based. So so you see still sold more on premise than in the cloud, but that's shifting as I said. And then the least far along is contact center, which has traditionally been a you know a stalwart of on premise software. Um, the transition to cloud for that product is also really beginning to accelerate um, as people get more and more comfortable with the technology. Um, so these different segments are in different phases uh, of, of their transition. Right, right. Yeah, and uh, in the behavior of organizations, enterprises, um, seems to be following a pattern uh, as we go through here. You know, the meeting platform, okay, I trust that the cloud works and it gets shifts, shifts over the adoption. You know, UCAS, Unified Communications as a Service, is one of those things that, you know, has traditionally been an in-house function with, a, you know, basically – you know, replacing a PBX and that's now shifting and then the contact center. And we're starting to see many, many use cases where the contact centers are going into the cloud mm -hmm. successfully. Yep. Uh, but it's, it's a big part of an organization's revenue and um, they're obviously doing it very carefully. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. And yeah. that sort of, you know, to argue why you see exactly this treasure timeline is, is get, getting people comfortable. Uh, right. Contact center is at least for long because in, the, in many ways it's the most mission critical business impacting thing, right? right. You know, right. Um, because it directly touches your customers. Yeah. Uh, but but the technology is getting good enough and the uh, reliability of many of these platforms are kind of demonstrated. People are getting comfortable. And then the benefits uh, where you can bring additional capabilities you just can't do on prem. They're, they're starting to outweigh those concerns. And so that's why we're seeing an acceleration of the shift. Exactly. So moving, skipping ahead a couple of slides, you pick up this, as part of the presentation, you, you pick up this concept, this massive cardinality reduction, yeah. um, focusing on instead of every enterprise having a, either a copy of the software and the connectivity to the network to run the software, that as things move to the cloud, suddenly you can compress a lot of this together. So maybe yeah. you can share this concept. Yeah, and the, the key idea here, as you pointed out, um, Alan, was to think about if as enterprises move from their on-premise software to UCAS based delivery and what does it mean for the surrounding ecosystem of technologies around UC? And so uh, if we think about SIP trunking in particular, you know, this is a, a very successful technology. And one of the reasons for it is there's a big market. There's lots of customers. Every enterprise that has an on-prem IP or SIP based PBX is a potential customer of SIP trunking and it has lots of economic benefits and, and it's done really well. And you know, the number of customers out there for a service provider like a Verizon or an AT&T to sell to is equal to the number of enterprises that have a SIP-based PBX. So that's probably hundreds of thousands of different customers that potentially can buy this product. Um, but, as that, but fundamentally, it's connecting the service provider to the enterprise's UC deployment. As those, as those deployments move towards the cloud, you don't need a SIP trunk to go to the enterprise data center anymore. Siptrunk goes right. to the cloud provider. And if you right. look at, like, well, how many cloud providers are there? Um, if you assume for a moment, you know, 100% goes eventually to cloud. You know, it'll never be 100%. It'll take a long line, yada, yada. But, but just look at the trend lines here. You know, the number of, of cloud providers of UC is going to be much, much smaller. It'll be like a dozen or something. If you will capture 80% of the market share. So the number of SIP trunks you need goes from hundreds of thousands to tens, right? This is a huge multi-order reduct, multi-order magnitude reduction, in the number of SIP trunks and the number of customers for selling these SIP trunks. And that has then, again, many ripple implications from there. So I thought that was really, really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. No, that was a fascinating sort of take out of the whole presentation was, you know, that thought process. I, I guess we sort of knew it was coming, right? In the back of your mind, was the concept of um, migrating from you know each individual organization having their SIP trunks, and of course the over provisioning that most people want for you know the right. busy hour planning, et cetera, et cetera. Well, there's a lot of sessions that are sitting, spinning, doing nothing, and, yes. and then by compressing them together, um, you, you can squeeze some of that uh, over provisioning out uh, and, um, and, yes. and deliver. You know, uh, more great point. Yes. with less equipment and less uh, exactly software. exactly you'll get much better utilization because it'll uh, it's it's aggregating and amortizing this capacity over more and more customers um, right. and ends up looking more regularized so right. yeah, absolutely and then there was one slide towards the end of the presentation that sort of per sparked my interest and this is a discussion about the enterprise SBC and we've talked in 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 uh, some of our blogs and posts and, try and uh, webinars that we've done before, trying to explain the difference between service provider SBCs and enterprise SBCs and how service providers um, use an SBC to protect their network and provide you know, access to their customers. But enterprises have been using SBCs at, the, at their front door um, to terminate SIP trunks. And a natural uh, side effect of that is, is that as we go through this consolidation, the need to have that kind of equipment out at a uh, at the enterprise changes, and um, you've got a, a you know a graph here. This starts um, first two to five years, and then there's a big lump that um, shows um, uh, an increase in enterprise uh, SBCs, but then eventually it tails off. And so maybe walk through your thoughts on this. Yeah. So so the enterprise SBC market, as you said, is tied to SIP trunking and. Um, uh, and, and it's my view that that will continue to grow for a little while as it has been generally growing as that we're continuing to see migrations off of TDM to SIP based trunking. We're continuing to see, we still have lots of 
circuit-based PBXs in production that are getting retired, um, and those move to uh, a SIP-based uh, software PBX, and we get a SIP trunk. So that market will continue to grow, and it will also, even as we move towards the cloud, a lot of these cloud providers are offering um, hybrid deployment models where you still have the SIP trunks on premise, you just keep the PBX in the cloud. And when you, sp when you split it in half that way, um, there's still a need for an enterprise SIP trunk and an enterprise SPC. And I think we'll see, especially for larger enterprises, a lot of uh, a take uptake of this hybrid models because it allows them to keep their numbers, keep their, you don't have to port anything, you don't have to change your, you have to get out of your contracts. It's actually probably the biggest problem right. for these guys is they have to break their, their telco contracts. Uh, and so, uh, so as we sort of see this hybrid model grow and, and the transition to the cloud, um, and as, uh, as we continue to see uh, replacement of CDM PBXs, we'll see this enterprise uh, SBC market increase. But at some point, it'll flip, right? As people go to UCAS, at some point, the economics and the cost effectiveness of the SIP trunks in the cloud, will it'll just be more cost effective uh, and easy to manage. And, uh, and we'll just see more pure UCAS. And mm -hmm. so the whole thing flips. And that'll then start the decline uh, of the enterprise SBC market. Right. Right. That's, so that's my prediction. We will see if I'm right. <laughs> well, your prediction. Well, we're in the season of predictions, so that's okay. That's true. So yeah, that's good. That's good. Uh, yeah, we're seeing some interesting use cases actually. So with our service provider SBC, uh, where we're starting to see a cloud provide, you know, a, a, a cloud platform. Let's say Twilio, for example. And we're seeing someone who has already has a contract with an established SIP trunk provider. And they said, I would like to use my cloud-based SIP trunks with this cloud-based service. So I need an SBC in the cloud that I can use to interface between these two and resolve some interoperability issues. So the whole thing is in the cloud. So, you know, they, they choose their own carrier. They want to use their carrier with the, with the uh, you know, cloud-based CPaaS platform. And they need a, a way to integrate the two of them together. And also, too, to supervise the use of the SIP trunks. Because one of the concerns of bring your own SIP trunks is, of course, you know that there's fraud potential, right. and they might be on the hook for that. So, um, a interesting combination of bringing different cloud services together, um, and that would essentially replace, you know, the enterprise side of the whole right. thing. It's all in the cloud. Exactly. So, so that'll mark a change in what this SPC functionality for the service providers are, because effectively the the SaaS, the UCAS providers now become the deployers and operators of these. Uh, SPCs peering with traditional telcos uh, over those connections, and right. um, that'll drive a demand for you know much better scale, um, you know more, much more complex and highly reliable uh, systems uh, than you would typically be able to deploy on prem, and a huge amounts of automation and simplification. Mm -hmm. you know, no one is going to want a web UI for configuration of those products. They're going to want um, you know, the ability to use APIs or, or config files that they can uh, add to their deploy and automation processes. And so uh, many of them will build their own as well, was one of my predictions. Um, uh, you know, as a SaaS vendor, you're in the business of running software. So this is a pretty critical component. There's a bunch of open source things you use at foundation. So free SBC, which, we, you know, you guys are obviously know about. And then, uh, you know, mm -hmm. free switch, you know, are all uh, widely used for these kind of things. And so I think we'll see a growth of those uh, and that'll be trouble, I think, for the more traditional, less customizable, out-of-the-box type of SBC products um, right. in the, for those markets. Another discussion for another day. Would love to pick that up at some point and yeah. talk about what, what happens. So yeah. anyway, I really want to thank you, Jonathan, for spending some time. Um, you really are one of the true uh, telecom disruptors, and I uh, you know appreciate all your contributions to the industry over the years and, and your, certainly your time today. Uh, and I've got a last couple of reminders here to our listeners. Uh, if you'd like to share your thoughts or comments, feel free to reach out to me at Twitter, uh, at Alan D. Percy. Uh, and Jonathan, you've got a Twitter handle. Yep, it's JD Rosen 2. JD Rosen 2, there you go. Uh, and of course, we have lots uh, of great content on blog.telcobridges.com. Make sure you subscribe, ensuring you don't miss any of the greatest, latest news and updates. And with that, I'd like to thank you, our listeners, and look forward to having you join us on another episode. This episode is sponsored by Telco Bridges, makers of free SBC session border controller software and high performance media gateway and signaling gateways. And for more on Telco Bridges, visit telcobridges.com. Mm -hmm.